this week on KSL Plus. Fallout over the U.S. Supreme Court's leaked draft ruling. Let me just say, there has never in the history of the Supreme Court been a leak of a preliminary opinion. That would, if adopted, overturn a 49-year precedent that determined women have a constitutional right to abortion. It's a surprise, but I guess it's not really that shocking because the politics have been building up to this for quite a while, and the appointments to the Supreme Court have been reinforcing this direction. I'm Matt Rascone, and this is KSL TV's digital-only news show and podcast. And this week, we dive into what a decision to overturn Roe v. Wade would mean for abortion, both in the country and in Utah. Last year, the Supreme Court took on a case that looks at the constitutionality of a Mississippi law that bans abortion after 15 weeks. We talked about it here on KSO Plus back in December. Now, a decision on that case is expected sometime around June. But on Monday, Politico reported on a leak of a 98-page draft Supreme Court ruling that would strike down Roe v. Wade if adopted. It's completely unprecedented. I can't think of a single example of this happening ever. Senator Mike Lee, who previously clerked under Justice Alito, says opinions like the one leaked are typically kept under tight security until the court is ready to release a decision. The Supreme Court, it's not bent on secrecy, it's bent on thoroughness. And it wants to make sure that its process is complete before it releases anything to the public, lest they create confusion for people subject to those opinions. They're kept on an off-the-internet server, and paper copies aren't allowed to leave chambers and are shredded and burned afterward. So when this opinion leaked, something went terribly, terribly wrong. And the people of the court and of the United States weren't well served by the leak. You can see now it puts the court in a really awkward position. Nobody really knows how the votes are going to be. They've taken a preliminary vote, but the judges, they write an opinion and then they try and get support, right? And this is part of the process. My colleague Ashley Moser spoke to State Senator Dan McKay about it after news broke of this leaked draft. The first thing I'd encourage the public to do is wait for a final opinion, right? Um, the, the right thing to do is to engage. And, and in, interestingly, um, the, the opinion, the draft opinion that was released, it does make reference to an opinion that was, was drafted 20 years ago on this decision, or 30 years ago on this, on this issue. And it says the way that we make these changes is we get involved, we sign up voters, and we have voters vote. Okay? It's really important that everybody recognizes that's the process. I know that there will be feelings on both sides of the issue. But when Roe v. Wade and the Casey decision were handed down back in 1974, 30 states in this country outlawed abortion. And Utah was one of those. And so in a lot of ways, if the Supreme Court goes along with that opinion, it will only be a recognizing of the state's ability to regulate at the, at the state level. So here's some background. In Roe v. Wade, the court determined women have a constitutional right to abortion based on privacy guaranteed in the 9th and 14th Amendments. In the first trimester, the court determined states cannot regulate abortions. In the second trimester, the state can regulate abortions only to protect the woman's health. And in the third trimester, the state can regulate or prohibit abortion except where it is necessary to preserve the woman's life or health. Now, the other defining case mentioned in the draft is the 1992 decision in Planned Parenthood versus Casey. There are a lot of parts to this case, but here are two big ones. First, it removed the trimester framework in Roe, replacing it with a pre- and post-viability. That means the state could not ban abortions before viability, or in other words, when a baby may survive outside the womb. Second, the court determined that a constitutional right to liberty protected abortion instead of a constitutional right to privacy. So back to the leaked draft. Well, Justice Samuel Alito wrote it and said, we hold that Roe and Casey must be overruled. 
The Constitution makes no reference to abortion, and no such right is implicitly protected by any constitutional provision. Alito argues in the draft majority opinion that Roe was on a collision course with the Constitution the day it was decided, and Casey, he says, perpetuated its errors. Roe was egregiously wrong from the start, he wrote. Its reasoning was exceptionally weak, and the decision has had damaging consequences. He blames Roe and Casey for inflaming debate and deepening division rather than settling the issue. You may remember in December on this show, we spoke to Professor Leslie Francis. She talked to us about the Mississippi law that bans abortion after 15 weeks. The question before the court is whether a pre-viability prohibition on abortion is unconstitutional. Francis also spoke to us about the argument that limits or bans on abortions should be left to the states. Let's take a couple of different ideas here. One idea would be that if there is a constitutional right, we don't just throw it to the states. I mean, there's a constitutional right uh, to equal protection that was recognized in Brown versus Board of Education. And on Mike Lee's analysis, if we should be throwing everything to the state, then we should be throwing racism to the state too. The issue is whether the people through their elected representatives should be able to decide how to protect human life and the life of mothers in the manner they deem fit. Now, there's a, another version which might have been what was behind Justice Kavanaugh's questioning, which is that we've got two really important rights here. We've got the constitutional rights of the woman, and we've got the rights of the fetus. And at one point in the oral argument, Justice Kavanaugh said, hey, we've got these two rights, they clash, they can't be both fulfilled together. So in that kind of a case, it should be for the states. I don't think Senator Lee was saying that because on that, I mean, if it really, if that really is Justice Kavanaugh's view, I don't think it would follow from that, that it's just for the states. There might be, for example, if, if what's going on is balancing both rights, simply ignoring one of them wouldn't meet that idea. Uh, so that's a second view. And then of course you could hold that the woman has a right that's overriding up until a particular point in pregnancy, whether that's viability or whether that's much earlier on. Alito concludes with this, the Constitution does not prohibit the citizens of each state from regulating or prohibiting abortion. Roe and Casey arrogated that authority. We now overrule those decisions and return that authority to the people and their elected representatives. So what would that look like here in Utah? Three years ago, we passed Senate Bill 174, and it was a trigger law that said, if the Supreme Court ever restores this right to the states and allows states to make those decisions, then the Legislative Council will review it, and if that's the case, we'll put 174 into action. State Senator McKay says there are 13 other states that have plans in place if Roe v. Wade is overturned. 174 basically bans abortions and makes an exception for health of the mother and for rape and incest. And I think those are important to kind of strike the right balance. This law would require the most dramatic form of, of overruling, which would essentially be that Roe was fundamentally wrong, that there is no constitutional right to uh, secure an abortion at, at any point during, uh, during the pregnancy. So it would have to be a pretty dramatic decision from the Supreme Court to, to trigger this law. If there were changes made to federal abortion law, Utah would ban all abortions except in the cases of life-threatening risk 
to the woman or a serious risk of substantial and irreversible impairment of a major bodily function. The fetus has a defect uniformly diagnosable and uniformly lethal or a severe brain abnormality that is uniformly diagnosable or rape or incest that has been reported to police. Professor Francis told us a few things could happen here. If the court's decision is a complete overruling of Roe or Casey, the whole framework, so there's no woman's constitutional right, then the so-called trigger statutes, you know, when Roe is overruled, we're going to prohibit all abortions or we're going to prohibit abortions except in this kind of case or that kind of case. Uh, one of the sad things about the Mississippi statute actually is that it doesn't contain an exception for rape or incest. And I, I mean, particularly with an incest victim where there's a, the victim might be very young where there might be a kind of shroud of secrecy or guilt or threatened punitive, um, a victim like that might not ever make it to medical care by 15 weeks. So what we might find is if the court's opinion is we're going to end the viability line, states are going to have to figure out what short of viability is a permissible regulation. So a trigger statute, because Roe would not have been completely overruled, probably depending on how it's drafted and whether it it's more specific about the form in which Roe is overruled, a trigger statute probably wouldn't go into effect if it's a limited, a limited change in Roe. If it's a complete overruling, what I think you'll see is in the many states like Utah, we'll have, that have trigger statutes, we'll have prohibitions on abortion as soon as the court decision is handed down. Is there anything else that we didn't talk about that you think is important or you wish people yeah. understood better? Yeah, I I don't know what a post-Roe world would look like, but, but one thing I think it would look like is a world that's more unequal because there are going to be many states in which abortion is permitted. And those states are not going to limit the procedure to their um, residents. And of course, countries across the globe permit abortion. So anyone who can fly to California or to France will be able to get an abortion. People who can't do that won't. And if, as the Texas statute seems to be doing, uh, the, the one that's at issue in the six week heartbeat bill privately enforced, that seems to prohibit even uh, telling somebody about the possibility they could get an abortion out of state or helping them get an abortion out of state. So paying for the plane fare for people who can't afford it. So, I mean, I think we'll end up seeing a lot more inequality and a lot more women in poverty, single women in poverty if Roe is overruled. Uh, and um, once again, deepening certain kinds of chasms in American life that are, people need to think about whether they are problematic. Now people say, well, what happens to the women who, you know, are now in a situation where, you know, they can't get an abortion, right? What I would tell you is that Utah is the place 
for a woman to be in that situation. We have resources available. We have more support in the community for women and children, uh, both you know for prenatal care as well as for children after they after they were born. And we also are in a situation now where the community can rally around, which maybe we weren't in that situation 50 years ago, but we are today. And I think it's important for women to recognize who are in that situation that they have resources, there are options available. Please, please don't look at the alternatives of you know, going to another state or doing something else to hurt yourself and or the baby. The Supreme Court has confirmed this leaked draft is authentic but said it does not represent a decision by the court or the final position of any member on the issues in the case. We expect a final decision in the next several weeks. That does it for us this week here on KSL Plus. I'm Matt Rascone. We'll see you again next week.